So, we'll get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks very much for coming to the very first Dublin React JS meetup. Um, a few housekeeping. Woo! Yes. A few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we'd like to thank HubSpot for sponsoring the space, food, and drink. So if you're enjoying that, thank you, HubSpot. Um, we started this meetup because uh, React is still a very, very new library. I mean, it's been around two and a half years or so, I think. Um, and best practices and patterns are still kind of emerging, and it's, it's kind of hard to learn them. They're changing so fast. So we thought it would be a lot easier to do that if we could all meet together in a group, discuss, and learn from each other. We're hoping to do this every two to three months, depending on, uh, depending on how many of you guys like it. Um, if you are interested in giving a talk um, in the future, please do get in touch with one of us organizers, either in person um, or on meetups.com. And uh, we'd really, really love to get that going. So the agenda today, we have chosen three really, really good talks, really, really basic ones. We haven't really assumed any prior knowledge of React since this is the first React meetup. Firstly, Gareth is going to give us a really, really good overview of React.js and the related technologies. After that, Rob is going to cover React Router, the most popular router used when building React applications. Uh, then we're going to have a break, have a chat, have some beers. And Claudio is then going to talk to us a little bit about um, JSX and how to get up and running with that. We're going to have questions at the end of each talk, so please do hold your questions until then. If you have one, I will come and find you with a microphone. So I'd like to hand over to Gareth now. Thanks very much. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. So, uh, as Kane said, my name is Gareth. I'm a front end developer at HubSpot, uh, working alongside Kane and Rob. Um, my background with React is uh, we've recently transitioned to a React based stack at HubSpot from uh, primarily Backbone, uh, using Backbone for our, our data models, our views, coupled to Jade and Handlebars for templating, and a lot of jQuery thrown in there too. Um, and it's been a, a breath of fresh air, really, for pretty much the entire. Uh, Front end team, everyone feels like they get they get a lot much a lot more work done, a lot easier, and it just it's much easier to kind of think and reason about what you're doing uh, when you're using React. And uh, without further ado, let's dive into why that is. So, the first big question: What exactly is React? To steal a quote from the official website, React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Uh, important thing to take from this is that they use the word library rather than framework. Oftentimes, if you're reading a blog post or an article about React, it might be compared to the likes of Angular or Ember, um, which are more frameworks for building entire applications. React focuses just on the UI. Um, it's basically the V from MVC. Uh, you can't really go out and build an entire complex application using just React. Um, you can if you really hate yourself and want to just use vanilla JavaScript for your entire data layer and all that sort of thing, but probably shouldn't. There's a lot of um, uh, libraries that have sprung up around React that lend themselves nicely to helping you fill in those gaps um, that React leaves, such as the data layer and synchronizing your data. Um, things like the Flux architecture, you may have heard of stuff like that, Relay, but uh, we're not going to get into them there. So. How do you build a UI with React? React prescribes a component-based architecture. So when you're building your UI, you'll split everything into individual React components. These can be large, complex views with lots of, lots of uh, logic in them, um, all the way down to tiny little elements of your UI, like buttons, labels, list items, anything like that. Um, components are the base building blocks of every React application. Um, you will, you will compose um, all your UI out of hundreds, many hundreds of components, as we found in HubSpot. Important thing about components is that rather than, say, a backbone view, um, which defines mostly its behavior and then uses a separate template to define its uh, presentation and appearance, components in React define both the behavior and presentation in, the single, in a single source file definition. Um, React, the, team, the React team saw these two 
things as inherently linked concerns. And so figured, <laughs> why not bring them both in to the same definition? And that way, it's a lot easier to think about what you're doing. And if you ever have to go back and trace some strange behavior or some strange appearance issues, you only have to look in a single place. And it works very well. So uh, let's take a look at the very simplest components you can build using React. Um, it's going to be our Hello World component. Here it is. It's a very straightforward, tiny component that just renders a Hello World inside of a H1. Um, so let's take it piece by piece. First of all, we have this react.create class function. This, contain, this takes a, an object containing a component specification and, cool, and returns a component definition that you can then refer to when you want to render and use this component in your UI. Um, in that component specification, we can see we have a single function called render. This is the one requirement of every component. They must implement a render function. Um, the reasoning is that, of course, all components eventually render something. They must have some rendered representation. Um, but apart from that, nothing else is required. Um, and what render does is it returns a description of what your component should look like at, the, at any state in time, given the current set of inputs and in state. Yeah, as I was saying, render returns a description of your component at, at any given state. Um, it doesn't return DOM nodes, despite what it might look like, but we'll, we'll get into that briefly. Um, so to actually use this component and render it into the DOM, you call react-dom.render. You pass your component definition um, wrapped in this tag syntax, which we'll cover in the next slide. Um, the second parameter is just a reference to a DOM node where you want the component to appear on the page. Um, for some of you, the more astute of you may have noticed, there's a reference to a React module, and then down below there's this React DOM. Um, to explain that, in the most recent major version, the React team decided to split the core React behaviors to do with creating, defining components and component-related um, utilities from the DOM-specific logic, like rendering into a DOM element or finding a DOM node that's um, the underlying DOM node for a specific component. Um, and this allows them to then develop alternate render targets um, while still using the main React component architecture. So you may have heard of things like React Native, which let people develop React components in the same style and patterns which they've been doing on web apps, but render them into native views on iOS and Android. So that's one such example of a different uh, render target. So yeah, the elephant in the room. What was that weird HTML right in the middle of our JavaScript function? So this is called JSX, and it's a syntax extension that Facebook developed, which simply makes it easier to kind of express your components as a, a nested hierarchy, similar to how they're going to eventually be rendered and composed in the DOM, or any, any alternate rendering target. Um, so they just get transpiled at a build step into normal JavaScript function calls. So if you really don't like having this HTML, XML-like syntax in your JavaScript, you can skip the build step and write the manual JavaScript function calls yourself. You don't lose any functionality by doing that. It's just, um, just a bit of syntactic sugar that makes it nicer to use. So that last component wasn't anything special. It was just a static string. Um, a more useful uh, refactoring of that component might be to make it more generic and be able to greet anyone and allow us to specify a name. So if we were to use such a component, it might look like this. We have a generic greeting, and we can specify a name, what looks like an attribute. Um, React refers to these as props rather than attributes. And these are the primary inputs into all your components. Um, so if we want to update our hello world component to use uh, inputs, then we can simply change our static string to refer to this.props.name. So this.props is the namespace under which all of your input properties are available. And if you just write curly braces around anything, it becomes an embedded JavaScript expression inside your JSX. And that makes it very powerful as a, a templating library or templating layer as such. If you have all the expressivity expressivity of um, native JavaScript at your disposal, then it becomes much more flexible in what you can do. You can return JS, J, 
JSX from other functions to help you render different segments of components, loop over um, collections of, of data, uh, anything you can do in normal JavaScript. So props define a one-way data flow throughout your component hierarchy from top to bottom, parent to child. Um, for coming from other libraries, this might seem a bit, bit weird, a bit restrictive almost. You can't read from a child as a parent, but you get, you get used to it pretty quickly um, when you start learning React, and it actually ends up making things a lot easier to reason about in your head. You know always that the data is flowing down through a tree, so you always know where things are going to eventually come from you don't have to go looking. Um, so that was an okay component. That was a bit more dynamic, a little bit more flexible. But sometimes or they were purely stateless. They took their input as props. Um, sometimes you do want a component that manages its own piece of state. For an example, you might want a simple counter that maintains the current count. It doesn't want to rely on some parent telling it what the count is, right? A counter knows what the count is. So we can take a look at building such a component here. Uh, it would be very simple, start at zero and have plus and minus buttons to increment and decrement the count. So first step might be printing out what the current count is. So this is very similar to our greeting, except in this case we're reading from this.state and that's, uh, as opposed to props, this is where all component local state is stored. But the question here is, what will this render at the moment? What is the value of this.state.count? We haven't specified it. We're not getting it from any parents. React doesn't know what it's supposed to be. It can't just assign default values. So it'll be undefined. So we need a way to specify what our state should start out as. Enter gets initial state. So this is a function that you can specify in your component specification, that thing that you pass to react.create class. And it allows you to return an object containing all your initial state. So if we update the counter with that implemented, it looks a little like this. We just return an object containing a count of zero. And now it's much more obvious what exactly is going to get rendered. And this is the result. So this slide shows actually a React app running an embedded React component for the slides. And that allowed me to take the examples and actually render them as React components so you could see the exact output. Um, so as we go forward, we need to implement the actual state updates. How do we make the counter change? Um, yeah, so how do we update the component state? There's a helper method called setState that all components can call, generally in an event handler of some sort. And all you do is you pass a new state object containing any updated values. Um, React will update your state, merging the new state on top of the old. So you, any keys that you don't specify in the new state will just retain their old values. Um, and then it re-renders the entire component. And then once it's re-rendered, things will be pulling new values from state and everything will be updated. Uh, that might seem a little wasteful. Why are we re-rendering an entire component on any state change? I mean, it could just have a very minor visual impact. But that seems like it's doing a lot of work. But the thing to remember is that render isn't instantiating any DOM. When it's called, it's just returning a description. Um, so React uses a virtual DOM system under the hood. And that lightweight description of your component uh, subtree returned from render is kept and then compared to the new one anytime render is called again. And then React can diff the two and compute the minimal set of changes it needs to make to the real underlying DOM in order to most efficiently update your component. So in a previous case, it would know the only thing that's changed isn't the containing tag, it isn't the containing, it isn't the current count text, it's just that one number. So then it can just go and update that single number inside the DOM. And that's much more efficient. So let's implement actual updates to our counter state. Uh, if we take a look here, we can add simple handlers called on increment and on decrement. And all they need to do is call this.set state and pass the new state. So for our new state object, we've specified the count, and the value we've passed is the current count plus one. And in on decrement, of course, that would be minus one. Just running out of screen real estate here, so I left it out. Um, and if you look in render, we've added two buttons and specified both of those handlers for their click handlers. So we can take a look 
of what exactly that looks like. This is the rendered component. We can see our buttons. And when we click, we can see that state gets updated and it re-renders nicely. And that's like pretty much all there is to the very basics of building components with React. I mean, you could, with this knowledge, you can go out and you can build, you know, a reasonable UI with some interactivity and uh, state changes. And like, it gives you the basic powers that you need to go out and start making UIs with React. Um, there, if you want to learn a bit more, there's, of course, the official documentation is a great place to start. Uh, it's actually really well done, and it gets you up and running with a local dev environment for transpiling your JSX, um, all that goodness. And then there's a few articles on you know, how do you think in components, how do you think in React. If you take a, a mock-up of a UI, a design, it goes through how to analyze it and break it down into components and subcomponents, and then compose the smallest components into the larger ones. It's uh, pretty good. I'd recommend it. Um, Another good feature of React then to look into is the component lifecycle. Uh, this is very important as it, it, it basically specifies all the different stages uh, a component goes through as it's being created, inserted into the DOM, or not into the DOM, into the component hierarchy as it updates, and then as it's removed from the component hierarchy. So this is a perfect place to uh, plug in uh, JavaScript functions that call out to, say, jQuery plugins, or subscribe to changes from a, a third-party library like a backbone model. If you specify a handler for my component just mounted, uh, then you can register event handlers for the change event on a backbone model and force a re-render from your component. That way, whenever the backbone model is updated, your component automatically re-renders and shows the latest data. Um, another good feature in React is called prop types. These are kind of a way of you, you add them to your component specification, and you can go through the expected types of all the props that your component supports, and whether or not they're required. It's not quite static type checking. All it does is give you a warning in the console in development mode. But, I mean, that can be very useful when developing and trying to trace down bugs when you're running new components. But as well as that, it kind of provides a pseudo documentation for when you're looking at new components you haven't used before. So if you want to use a component that a coworker or, or some third party has written and they have defined their prop types well, then it becomes much easier to kind of dive in and figure out what you need to pass to it and what the behavior will be when you do. Um, finally, there's a, a more complex special prop called children, and that will always contain any components passed to a React component um, inside of it. So, for example, the text inside the H1, which we rendered, was nested inside the H1 tag, right? So if you nest more components inside your custom React component, then they're available to the component on the children prop. And then from there, you can do things such uh, as simple as just adding a nice wrapper around them when you render them, um, to injecting custom props and modifying their behavior as a result, um, and a whole bunch of other things. You'll actually see a usage of it in Rob's talk when he talks about the router. Um, so that's all I got for the intro. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much for coming. And any questions? Why aren't you using stateless um, functional components? I wanted to just kind of start at the very bare bones and not really get into the kind of newer cutting edge features. And I figured, you know, React.create class is the starting point that everyone initially learned when defining their components, right? And it's, it's kind of the one with the least limitations as well. So if you have stateless function components, um, it, it's kind of more difficult to add, say, I don't know, a pure render mix in, for example. Or you know, prop types, it's kind of less obvious. Whereas with create class for beginners, I feel everything's inside that component specification. It's just kind of easier to follow initially. It does seem like they want to move away from create class and probably eventually be deprecated and killed off. I mean, possibly. Um, I don't think they've expressed any plans on where exactly they want to go with um, component definitions, right? Well, they've I think the only thing that's stopping them from doing it makes sense. Sure, that's but... Basically, they want to minimize the API. To definitely. As small as possible. Yeah, but they don't have a plan for what they're going to replace makes sense with. Uh, it's in React Future repo, I think. 
yeah. plan is to get rid of that. Yeah, eventually. But I mean, at the moment, if anyone wants to dive in and start learning React, this is going to be a core feature of it for a while now. There hasn't been any even initial PRs to deprecate those APIs. I mean, sure, going to cover stateless function components is, is definitely a nice feature and definitely something worth looking into. But I just figured we'll start with the basics with support that's most flexible for now. Yep, yep. There's there's all sorts of these alternative APIs that you can use, but um, I wanted to keep it quite short and sweet, so I just chose the, the one most flexible approach. Anyone else? Great, cool. Thanks very much. So we're gonna call it a drinks break now, um, until we figure out what's going on with the speakers. Um so Tokens back there. See you all in about 10 minutes or so. Tokens right behind you. So, hey everybody. Can you hear me down the back? Is it up better now? Hey. You. Great. Um, hope you're having a good night. My name is Rob Campion. I'm a front end dev at HubSpot. And today I'm going to talk to you about React Router. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to ask people how many people have used a routing library? in a front-end application or any application they've built. If you could raise a hand, please. Okay, so the vast majority of people have used some sort of routing library. First question I'm going to ask is, what is routing? So most people will know, but it's essentially a mapping of, for your application. So in this example, we have a URL, which is an address, essentially, which points to Spencer's Sure. So on the right-hand side, you have a view. On the left-hand side, you have your URL or address. So routing will, will do this for you. You put in your URL, and you'll get back a view. It'll also do the opposite for you as well. So let's say in JavaScript, we redirect to a view. It will re-update your URL for you. So if we have the opposite of what Google Maps does, and we actually click on a location, it will give me an address for that location. So a router will do two of those things for you. In terms of routers themselves, they're not a new concept. So most of you remember a router at home like this that you use to direct traffic, say internet traffic from uh, the internet to your computer. That's our oldest idea of a router in computer terms. But even in, a, even in the web terms, they're not new. So uh, Apache had this 20 years ago where we do mappings from, say, a URL to a location on your local file system. So here you can see you've got a home URL. It points to a home um, a directory. And on that directory, you might have some HTML that's rendered to the, to the user. And also, you'll see there we have a redirect um, from foo to some location. So we have redirects and we have URL mapping on the oldest 20 years ago we had this technology available to us. A lot of people might have used uh, Java also, so in spring you can set up servlets. So here you see we've got a URL pattern on the bottom part and uh, that maps to a servlet, which is a Java class, which essentially might return some HTML to the user. Um, I don't know how many people have used Angular or come from an Angular background, so a few as well. Uh, I used Angular for two years before I started using React. Um, and this would be the way you would set it up. You would have, again, some URLs which would map to HTML here, uh, and also some controller, which would be JavaScript. And again, you have some sort of redirect down here. So React isn't entirely different. So as Garth showed you, we have JSX in React. And we can use JSX in React Router to set up our routing configuration. So our top node here is our router. So that's something React Router will actually give to you. Um, and underneath we have a number of routes. So for example, we have an example route, embedded within that we've got an index route, um, and a blog route, and a about route. And each of these routes will actually map to a component, so the components will return HTML based on that route. And I'll go through each of these in turn, we'll go through examples as well, make it a bit more obvious. So why is routing important? First of all, a well-defined URL is memorable for your users. OK, they might know the full URL, but as they start typing, their browser should automatically populate for them. So a good example of this is the Irish Times website. You have sports sections, so I go to irishtimes.com, 
I might start typing sport and then it will automatically uh, populate soccer for me. So it just makes it easier for users to navigate throughout your application if you've got a well-defined URL. It also means they're more likely to bookmark it and share it. So say on Twitter or Facebook, they're more likely to uh, share the link out and people are more likely to click it. If a URL has a load of IDs in it or doesn't make sense, people might be a bit wary of it. But if it's got a, a strong URL, um, they're more likely to click into it via Twitter or social networks. It also has a big impact on SEO. So here you can see if I type in Irish soccer, I get back um, the Irish Times soccer page as one of the first results. Uh, so what the algorithm will do, it won't automatically put it at the very top, but it will rank it higher based on the, the URL. So it knows the keyword, keywords here are Irish and soccer, so I'm going to give you um, the Irish Times soccer page as its first result. And finally, it's a nice blueprint for devs. So in this example, we've got a, um, some sort of error, and we've got some sort of error logging system in place. We've got a JavaScript error, and we're trying to figure out where the hell did it come from. And as you can see down here, we've got a URL. So we've got a good starting point. Without that URL, it's very hard for us to uh, figure out where the, where the actual problem occurred. But in this case, I can click in and hopefully get a solution quite quickly. This is where React Reader comes in. So React Reader itself was started last year, only a year old, just over a year old. It was inspired by Ember's Reader. I don't know how many people use Ember here. Should get a balance. One person? Two people? Okay. Um, so it's inspired by their router. Uh, version one was only this month. Uh, it's a non-Facebook project, so unlike React itself, which is developed by Facebook employees, this is built by two guys who set it up initially, but is also a large community which commit to it daily. It's a good thing uh, that it is a non-Facebook project in that we can actually lead the direction. We can point it to where we think it is best to go. Um, and finally here, it's just de facto React routing library. There are other routing, uh, React routing libraries about, but this is the best one. It's got the best community. It's got the best docs. So now I'm going to go through examples. First one is a very, very simple example. So I've got an example here, and excuse the UI, I know it looks fantastic, but I just wanted to get the, the basic of, of the router in place. So here you can see you've got a homepage text being displayed to the user. So how do we get that set up? Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is the app itself. So here we've got an application. And inside this application, we have a React DOM.render. So this can be used to render components onto your page. In this case, we're using it to render our router component onto the page. Uh, so router is provided to us from React Router. So if you see up here, we've got React Router. Um, and we essentially say we want our routes um, to be put inside that router. I'll go into more details about what the routes is or what the routes are. Um, in the next page. You can also see down here we are uh, giving it a node that we want it to render onto on the page. So in this example we've got um, a div with um, an ID of page and if I open this up, so I've got a jade file here, it's essentially the same, it just um, compiles into HTML, we've got a div with an ID of page and it renders to that. So if I open up Inspector here I can see uh, we've got a div with home page inside it, and we've got a div ID page here. So again, if I open up the home page component, oh sorry, I'll go to our roots first. So yeah, this is our roots. This is the real meat of the application. In this example, we just have example one as our URL. So if we flip back here, then it might be hard to see, but hopefully you can see it there. We've got example one in our URL. Um, and we say, when example is hit, we've got an index root. So think of an index root like an index.html. It's the main component you want loaded on that page if no other component is met. So in this example, we've got uh, example one, and we want our home page to load. So we'll open up our home page here. You can see we've got a render function. So as Garth mentioned in his presentation, uh, each component must have a render function inside of it. And this is no different. It's got a render uh, function and it just returns simply a div and a homepage text. 
and we flick back, that's exactly what we get. Okay, pretty simple, I hope. Less examples should make more sense as we go along. So obviously you can't build an application with just one page in it. You're gonna want multiple pages living under the same uh, single page application, but you're gonna want different views as, as the user navigates through, through the app. So you want more pages. So for our exec, second example, we've just added two more pages here. We've added a blog page and an about page. So I can click into these and note the URL has changed to blog. We've got our blog page component here. Quite straightforward. Uh, similarly, if I go to about, the URL has changed and I get a completely different view with about in it. So if we look at the, um, the routing setup for it, You see here we've got two more routes added. So it's exactly the same what was there previously, but we've added two more routes. We've added a blog route and an about route. And both of these routes have a um, path attribute or property, whatever you want to call it. And that essentially says when this path is met, we want to render this component. So we've got a blog page component here, and we've got a path uh, text here. So for example, if it was typed this out, if example two, Uh, forward slash blog was met it's going to hit this blog component okay does that make sense so, okay so if you open up our blog page component you can see here again it's just a simple react component that returns some html to the user and that's what we see at the end result here okay Our third example would be root not found, so it's pretty common. Um, most servers will have some sort of 404 system in place. It's no different with a React router. Um, oh, I'll show you here, actually, example first. So if I go to example three here, um, same as we had previously, when it loads up. Yeah. So same as we had previously, we've got a blog and about page, but now let's say if the user enters in an incorrect URL, or some URL that we haven't set up for, um, we just get a 404. So here you can see we've got a 404 um, page being showed. So how are we, how we doing that under the covers? Uh, it's really quite simple with React Router. You have a, a wildcard path, and that essentially says that any um, if not, none of these paths are met, we have a wildcard, and we say we want to render this page instead. So this page 404 is a component that we've set up. Uh, and you can see here we're just returning a div with 404 inside it. Exactly the same as the other components, just with different text. In a real world application, obviously you'd have a lot a bigger um, application here. You'd have a lot more components being rendered to the view, etc. But in this case, it's just a simple um, how the routing works more so than the components. Okay, so that's root not found. Our fourth example will be passing parameters. So... Um, it's likely that you might have a page, like a blog page, that is uh, pointing to a particular article. So you might have a blog repository and you have uh, some article and it is um, defined by an ID. So you've got some ID for a blog page. So say, let's say for this example we have a blog page with an ID of 1. Um, we want to be able to get straight to that article without having to go through like a home page or whatever else. So here we've got example four, forward slash, blog, forward slash, one. I'll just zoom in on that. You can see. And when I hit this page, I got some blog. Okay, so we've got some blog with a number. Here's the ID that we passed through. And we get some text. And I've got blog pages set up for um, second ID. And I've got blog pages set up for a third ID. So let's look at how we do that inside the router. So here we've got our roots.js. Again, it's pretty much stayed exactly the same as the previous example, apart from we've added this ID, so a colon ID. And this allows us to specify um, what we want the string mapped to inside the blog component. So to make more sense of that, let's open up the blog page component. You can see here, so this.props is a React concept. You have that in pretty much every application that has properties, or every component that has properties. Uh, React Router injects this params object inside of that properties. So within there, we have access to ID. Um, that ID, the actual naming of that ID comes from the root. So for example, if I were to change this to param2, uh, and I updated this to param2, uh, 
it would still work. So that, that naming is actually coming from the router itself. Uh, and as you can see here, like generally what would, what would happen, the, this component would mount or would get started and would be starting to load and you would make an asynchronous request to get some data back from the server based on the ID. In this example, I just have um, an object essentially which maps um, the ID down. So here we can see our blog ID is this blog and ID. Oops. And our text is our blog object up here. We're just getting a, a property from it and rendering the text. Okay. That's passing parameters. Pretty common case in an application. So the next one is embedded pages. So at the moment we've had a very um, linear structure. We just had a page and a page. There's been no kind of embedded pages. So let's say I wanted to have an about page with more content inside it. So now we've added an about page with two of my favorite things, popcorn and football. <laughs> and we have a sub view within it. So we've got an about page and then if I click on this link, I've got some blurb here that pops up about popcorn. And similarly, if I go to football, some blurb pops up about that. But notice what's different from our home page is when we click these links, we are redirected to um, a new page. But in this example, we've actually rendered a subview. So we've got a subview inside about. And coming from Angular as well, this is one of the things that the old router was lacking severely. There was no way of doing this, having a subview. In, in React router, you can have as many subviews as you want. So you could have 100 subviews all declared inside it. So for example, this popcorn view could have another subview inside it based on the URL. And I should note also that the URL is updating uh, as I go down. So I've got example five about popcorn. And if we look at the route for this, okay, you can see we've got our uh, about page here, and that's our about page component. But we've added two sub nodes to that about page, and it's important that they're sub nodes and not sibling nodes. So here you can see we've got a path of popcorn and a path of football. And essentially, if you look up here, um, this mapping here, example five about popcorn, will match directly with this. If this was um, ACF here, it wouldn't match at all. But in fact, because it's, we've got the path matching down here, it matches up correctly. So let's have a quick look at about page, because that did render some links inside of it. So we've got our links here being rendered, and our links point to um, that location. So here we've got, this route here is just example five. Um, example five, four slash about, four slash popcorn, that ring links into the component. But the most important part of this whole component is this.props.children. So Garth kind of briefly mentioned it. It's a way of, in this case at least, rendering a subview inside your main view. So I could move this, um, this line to above the about, okay? And if I refresh this now, you can see the text has moved up. So essentially what you're doing with this uh, this.props.children is you're saying this is where I want the children node to be displayed when that uh, route is matched. And as I said, you could have a popcorn page that has this this.props.children inside it as well, and it would be a subchild of that. Redirects. Okay. So, football is a pretty ambiguous term. It means something different here. It means something different in the states. In the UK, it means football generally, but here it's completely different. The states is different. So, I wanted to change it to a um, more clear term. So. In this example, I'm going to, I'm actually going to comment this out first, just to show you. That's how you do comments in JSX, it's not the prettiest, but it gets you by. <laughs> so we've got our about page here, um, and our football link that was previously is now broken, so we're getting our 404. Because what I've done inside here, I've actually changed the path, I've, I've put in a path of soccer and i put in a new soccer page component. 
But what I can do with React Reader again is it can have a nested redirect. So the nested redirect will allow me to say when football path is hit, <coughs> redirect to the soccer path. So in this example, when I refresh the page here, it does redirect to my soccer page. So it's a real handy way of just setting up simple redirects um, that are entirely on your front end. And if you change your URL, all is not lost, you can still um, have a working application. Then some extras. It's our last example. Oops. Okay. So we had the idea of a parameter, sort of like a parameter within our URL. But what if we wanted a query parameter? So what if we wanted something like, um, example, seven, four slash, about, four slash, Let's say in our popcorn page you wanted to show an image, right? So we have a show image parameter. How do we get that to work? And based on that show image, obviously do something different within the component itself. So I'll just actually show an example of that working first. So we've got our about page, we've got our popcorn page, but now we want to add a parameter, so we want to say uh, show image equals to true. I zoom out here, you get a lovely picture of popcorn there. Okay? And then obviously when this parameter is missing, the image is gone. So how do we get that to work? So we actually don't change anything from the router itself. We, when we deep dive into the component, which is our popcorn page here, you'll see we have a render image function. So this is something that's called from the render function. And essentially it says, uh, or it has access to this location uh, object. So think of location very similar to window.location that you have in JavaScript. Very, very similar. Um, but this is something React Reader actually injects into your desktop props and you can access it very easily. So in this example, we have our query parameters. So if I add another query parameter here, say, let's see if it's true, I would have access to it within this query object as well. Um, in this case, I've got a query.show image. So if show image is true, then we want to render the image. Pretty straightforward. A nice way of, of handling things. But actually, I might just print this for a second. You can see what's in the... Let's see, does this work? Yeah, so you can see here, this is our location object. Uh, the query... Oh, just increase the size of that, actually. Um, the query object is there. It's empty at the moment yet, but if I add... Oh, it shouldn't be empty. I don't know. It shouldn't be empty, but uh, as you can see, there's other properties there as well. So if I put in show image, that should be... Come on, yeah. Okay, so show image is there. Um, <laughs> and you can see, you can see, that's totally not set up, it's real. Uh, you can see you have access to other things there as well, um, like path name, which is similar to window location of path name. And our search string here as well. Okay, so that's our location. Um, a custom 404, so you might have seen from the last time when we, um, we got just a 404 on the about page when we wanted to uh, when we tried to go to football and it wasn't there, we just got a 404. But let's say if we wanted a custom um, 404 inside our about page. So here we can see you cannot find article. So what we've done here is we've got a child root on our about page. And again, it's important that the child within this root here. And it says a wildcard of it can, if it cannot be found, go to the about page 404. And if you open this up, you can see you cannot find article. So you can have custom 404s all the way down through your paths and through your roots. Okay. Last example here is our life cycle. So obviously this is all well and good, but it's very much static data. So let's say if we wanted to have a more dynamic kind of application, how would that work? Well, uh, first thing, we would use this component in mount. So this is a React function. It's a life cycle function that gets fired anytime the component is loaded. So let's say if we went into the about page, you can see here the home page has been unlo unloaded, or it says un will unmount, so it's been unloaded. And then we've got our about page that actually comes in. 
Uh, and with that about page, you go off and make an XHR request within this function. See here, when we go into popcorn, we've got our component that made popcorn, but the about page is not unload, not just yet. If you go to football, the popcorn page goes out and the soccer page comes in. And finally, if we go out and back to the home page, you notice as well, this every, all this is a single page application, so there's no re rendering of content, the whole, entire content, it just re renders what it needs to re render. So here, back to our home page, you can see the about page finally unmounted and our home page mounted. So in your unmount, you could have cleaned up all resources that you use within, and then in the home page, you can make another request for more, more data if you wanted to. So resources, um, I was going to put in a couple of tutorials here, but I couldn't really find any on the latest version of the React Reader. So as I said, it only came out this month. Um, but the documentation they have on their GitHub site is very good. They've got, I don't know, 20 examples of how you set up an application. They've steps all the way down through it. So it's quite easy to get up, set up quite easily um, from their GitHub page. And that's it. Thanks very much. Any questions? Yeah, I'll just give you a mic actually this time. Yeah, good point actually. So that is provided by the reader as well. It used to be a lot more powerful in that you could just specify a name instead of a path. So I'll show you if I go to my homepage here. You see, you have to specify an entire path to get to um, that route. Previously, in the old version, you could just specify a name. So you could have a name defined within your route, like, say, football. And I would just say, go to football. I don't care where it is. But they've changed it up um, to make it more clear about where you're going in the application. Um, so you have to say. But Link itself, this is a React uh, router component that they give you. Good question. Do you want to try this one, Ken? Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. Oh. The volumes, yeah. I just asked a question. Yeah. Can, does it have to That's a good question. I honestly don't know, but I, I think you have your. So are you saying to have multiple routers maybe within an application? Yes. Yeah, um, you want to split them. I know, and I say so, kind of yes. But one of the ways of doing it is so you're saying you'd be you'd be too concerned you'd have a massive um, root definition here at this app, this page. So what you could do, you could split this up entirely. So you could have a um, so see the way I have all these routes defined here. I could actually take these out and put them into a separate file, and I say these are my routes for my about page. And that way it's kind of separation, you know, so you're not just left with a massive definition of roots, you can actually split them up per file, yeah, which is kind of nice. There probably is a way of doing it better, but just offhand is the best way I can think of. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the um, URL parameter, <laughs> <laughs> uh, parameter that disappeared in your, uh, in your inspector, was it the uh, router uh, white lists URL parameters? Must be. I can try it if you want. I honestly didn't try it before I came in, but um, I can try it really quickly. So here I've got, if it does, it's very smart, but we'll see. So let's say if I go, oh. this is ES6, by the way, just in case. I should have mentioned that if it looks a bit funny. Um, it is. So <laughs> let's show me, I'm going to say test. Let's say test, okay? Let's see if this works. So if I go back. Image. I've access to it here. Okay, let me just try this. Oh, wait a second. That's a level seven. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know, I thought it's the URL, but I'm just wondering. Oh, sorry, sorry, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yep. Now, let's see if I remove it from here. Does it.
Because he didn't search string, all right. Yeah, it's still there. So yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Maybe it didn't refresh probably the first time, but it's, it's there now. Good question. Any more? Yeah, John. Is the router deterministic? What do you mean by conflicting route? Two routes, two We can, yeah, we can find out if you want really quickly. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. So you're saying if I have here a soccer page, I'd say it's going to be the first first one it hits. So what did I name it? So popcorn, popcorn. So if I go, boom, popcorn. <laughs> I can I can read I can read it. So if I put this here like that, it's number seven. Football. So it's the first one it hits. Yeah. Good question. Okay, great. Thanks, man, guys. Um, we're going to take another probably 10 to 15 minute break, grab a drink, and we'll be back here. Claudia's going to talk about JSX. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, so this third uh, talk is gonna uh, cover how to build a JSX. So we saw a lot of JSX uh, uh, in the previous uh, two uh, sessions, and now we're gonna cover briefly how to actually compile it to uh, the, primitive, the primitives that actually create components and render them to the DOM or whichever target uh, we want to um, uh, address. So my name is Claudio. I'm a uh, um, um, full stack web developer. I'm, uh, uh, I was working for uh, IBM Enterprise Social Solutions in the past and I was um, prototyping with the IBM design team uh, a prototype based on uh, React. So I was pretty much exposed uh, first, time, first hand on these, to these uh, uh, concepts and uh, challenges. So um, First of all, uh, just to refresh what's JSX. Uh, when Pete Hunt uh, announced React at uh, JSConf U in 2013, I'm not sure how many of you have seen the video, uh, the, audience, the audience was shocked by the, uh, the, the fact that uh, the simplification that he uh, advocated was to re-render everything whenever state or props were changed in the application. This is something that probably comes from uh, a video games background where uh, views have to be very fast and uh, pretty much functional components where um, the uh, the views are uh, pretty much stateless and uh, render everything that's pushed from from the input and uh, probably the the fact that JSX uh, was uh, literally embedding templates into JavaScript was a bit uh, overlooked Essentially, JSX is an extension to JavaScript that also contains some sort of XML-like tags. And uh, sort of counterintuitively to the uh, uh, familiar concept of a separation of concerns, uh, merges the template with the behavior. So uh, it's a bit uh, weird if you come from frameworks that use uh, templates separated from uh, logic or behavior, like for instance, angular partials or whatever, uh, or even Rails. And uh, it's also uh, just a syntactic sugar for the React primitives. Uh, but we also see it's not just React. JSX can be compiled to other uh, frameworks that uh, uh, are compatible and uh, work off virtual DOMs. Um, virtual DOM is a concept that was probably uh, uh, just glimpsed that in the in the previous uh, sessions. So pr pretty much the main innovation of React is that it decouples the the definition of the, the, the components and uh, the 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 creation of the instances from the actual uh, rendering of the instances onto a target, which could be a uh, call device. So we could technically decouple this and decouple uh, and render to a target that could be the DOM, but not necessarily the DOM, it could be a string, it could be a native uh, uh, toolkit framework, for instance, for iOS or for Android. And so um, it's essentially hiding the complexity of uh, the primitives that we use to actually render to something. 
So uh, JSX, is a, at a glance, as uh, we saw previously, is just a uh, bunch of XML-like tags embedded into JavaScript. And they're actually used as uh, pretty much uh, first-class uh, objects. Uh, keep in mind that if you have multi-lines, it's a good idea to wrap them into uh, parents. And uh, you can normally find uh, JSX uh, tags into the render methods of the uh, React classes and also into the render method of React DOM or other uh, targets uh, where you can render uh, these components. And uh, um, it's important to note that uh, React components have uh, uppercase uh, tag names while uh, by convention, uh, lowercase tag names are mapped automatically to uh, the HTML tags, which are primitives. Another thing is to keep in mind is there are some gotchas. Uh, React, since it uh, needs to create uh, tags that could be created pretty much from a uh, variety of sources, you can even create the uh, JSX from strings, etc has a white list of HTML tags and attributes, so you cannot really uh, use everything. The obvious exception is that the data attributes and the area uh, attributes are uh, uh, accepted as is. And uh, most of the elements that you, you will pass uh, will not be rendered if they're not part of the white list, and so uh, uh, it's a good idea to uh, open uh, issues for tags that you, you may need, but they're not part of the white list. And also, um, you can also pass JavaScript strings as content of attribute values. Um, since React performance is capping on most of the values that are uh, passed to the attributes and properties, there are accessors that allow you to dangerously set the inner HTML uh, with uh, non-escaped strings, but that pretty much uh, delegates to you the uh, uh, management of input strings to prevent XSS attacks or sort of other security vulnerabilities. And uh, this also means that since all the uh, attributes are uh, essentially uh, valid JS, uh, this means that, for instance, attributes like class cannot be used in, um, this is, the, there's no, example here. But for instance, you cannot use class in the uh, in JSX attributes. You, you, you must use class name and so forth. Uh, Are you talking about um, what's the name? reactive components. reactive elements? No, if you use web components in your JSX, Hmm. I have no idea why this difference. Interesting. I'll, I'll have to check that out. I've never used that. Uh, well, Did we have mix? a mixture of web components in React. So the legacy stuff was web components. So that's why we actually use class. Mm -hmm. It's just weird. I don't understand why there's a difference. I've never looked into it. Cool. But they, uh, are they like lowercase uh, lower custom class, tags? Yeah. 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 Cool. Like, like no, the, the tag name itself. The tag name is lowercase, yes. Cool. Because it's a, it's a web component, it's a DOM component. Mm -hmm. It's not a React component. And you have a, like a pre uh, preliminary step of compilation before you actually compile the JSX, maybe. Yeah, so the JSX would have a mixture of, like, like in your first example, you have div and span, whatever, okay? So yep. a web component will be my list, will be lowercase. Mm -hmm. And instead of using class name, you use class. Gotcha. But that would be a custom tag. It is a custom web component. Cool. Interesting. I'll, I'll get back to you to check uh, exactly what's going on there because I suppose it's a pre-compilation step before JSX actually is compiled. Well, I think the reason why they uh, they changed it to use class name instead of class is because class was a, um, um, a, a, it's a sorry it's reserved it's a reserved JavaScript keyword. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know why for web components it's fine. I'll, I'll check it out because it, it made me, you made me curious about that. Thanks for bringing that up. And so uh, essentially the transform is pretty simple. Um, when you have a, um, a literal JSX string like app equals uh, Angular 
uh, bracket avatar user ID, so there's a custom attribute there, which is uh, called prop, as we saw, uh, set to Claudio Pro. Uh, it is uh, compiled to react.create element, and then the avatar uh, is the, uh, the name of the class that's uh, used to uh, render that element, and then a uh, an object that contains uh, key values uh, uh, of attributes and the, uh, the corresponding values is passed the second uh, uh, argument to create element. The transform is also uh, applicable to nested structures like we saw in uh, React Router. Uh, you could have uh, arbitrary deep structures of uh, JSX so you could compile a, a string or a JSX expression like this. So um, it is actually rendered as a uh, hierarchical uh, creation of two elements. So one external nav that has a null uh, text content and then as a uh, another element inside it uh, of class avatar and then the usual properties that we saw in the previous example. And so, composing these uh, simple transforms, you could uh, parse pretty much any complex structure of JSX. Uh, you can have as many uh, properties as you like. You could have um, even um, spread uh, attributes. Uh, so you could uh, parse pretty much any attribute, even if you do not uh, declare it a priori in your uh, class definition. We'll see that uh, maybe with an example later on. And so now we're going to cover uh, the build tools that allows that allow us to um, actually uh, parse uh, and compile JSX to um, work in JavaScript. Um, so we're going to cover uh, the Babel compiler first, which is a very uh, powerful uh, JavaScript compiler uh, that recently uh, was released in version 6, which is a major rewrite and uh, uh, is now based on a composable uh, architecture. Browserify, which is a, um, um, uh, an amazing creation by uh, Substack, James Halliday, who came up with this idea to run node modules in the browser, which can be used to um, aggregate your uh, React uh, modules uh, as common JS modules and uh, um, actually uh, run them into a uh, single uh, kind of layer in the browser in any other target uh, runtime. And then Webpack, which is a more complex uh, build tool, uh, again, based on a uh, plugin architecture, um, which is pretty powerful, and uh, I'm not just going to scratch the surface on it. So Babel, uh, previously uh, known as uh, 6 to 5, if uh, any of you used it in the past, uh, is now at version 6. It's a powerful and extensible JavaScript compiler built out of plugins. And you can compose your own uh, transformation pipeline using existing plugins or writing your, your own. And uh, plugins are uh, conveniently grouped and handled using presets. So um, you can have a preset for React, for instance, or for uh, ES6. And uh, taking care of all the uh, corresponding transforms, for instance, for arrow functions, etc. Uh, by grouping the corresponding plugins that do especially that specific transformation. And uh, Babel has support for the latest uh, uh, version of JavaScript through syntax transformers. So um, you could write your uh, JavaScript using ES6 or even experimental JavaScript uh, syntax and uh, uh, delegate the um, the compilation to Babel, so you uh, actually produce valid JavaScript in uh, um, kind of ES5 uh, uh, syntax, and you can make it work in current runtimes and browsers. And uh, so this allows you to be uh, not just testing out different uh, capabilities of the language that are just experimental, but also uh, shape the future of the language. Most of these features are pretty much uh, grouped into stages for uh, upcoming proposals. And um, by using these features and uh, uh, understanding how they're 
helping out uh, developers to become more productive, more uh, concise, or addressing different um, use cases in a in a better way. You could even uh, address the um, the the future uh, roadmap of the languages. Is it the TC thirty nine that actually manages the staging, etc. So um, it's actually something that shapes the future of JavaScript. Um, so plugins are essentially uh, very uh, simple and uh, 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 atomic parsers for a new experimental syntax. So uh, essentially, object rest spread properties, um, arrow functions, um, modules, uh, etc. And um, you can also transform uh, ES6 modules to require JS, uh, AMD, or UMD. You can do uh, pretty much um, all sorts of transforms, or um, as a like a fallback for all the other modules that are not related to parsers or transforms. It's uh, miscellaneous, essentially. Um, they're catch-all for all the other module types, uh, sorry, plugin types that do uh, various uh, uh, serve different purposes, like undeclared variable checks. Presets are, as I said uh, earlier, groups of plugins that are grouped uh, conveniently for common build profiles. For instance, to build React, you have uh, the JSX uh, parser and the validators. Uh, ES6 gives you all the different uh, syntax options um, for the different features of uh, ES2015. Uh, and experimental syntax uh, grouped by stage, stage 0, st stage 1, and so on. Um, so Babel uh, can be configured as a uh, through a config file. Uh, if you create a .babel RC file at top level in your project, uh, Babel will uh, read it and uh, uh, get config options from that file. And you can specify uh, even parameters for plugins and presets. So uh, you can specify how these plugins behave, not just uh, to call them out, but also specify how they actually behave and passing them parameters. And um, Babel RC is also honored by Babel when running a directory. Uh, so some options can be overridden uh, through command line arguments, but others cannot. So uh, pay attention to uh, how to layer command line flags uh, and Babel RC options. So essentially, uh, to get started, you would normally install the Babel CLI uh, node module using NPM and uh, the corresponding presets that you want to use and save them to your package JSON to uh, make sure that the uh, whoever is going to pull down your fork your uh, project and uh, clone it uh, will also uh, download them when uh, running an npm install without any arguments. And for instance, you can create a .babelrc that uh, uh, calls out the React preset. So this means that um, when Babel is invoked on your project, uh, the React plugins will be activated and will take uh, will have effect on your on your JavaScript modules. So transforms are um, uh, possible in various ways um, during development and during production. You could have different uh, approaches based on what's more convenient to, for for your particular workflow. Um, during development, you could pro probably use uh, a very uh, lightweight in browser transform, although that's a very bad idea for performance. Uh, you could have a CLI build, a uh, common line build during a uh, build phase, for instance, using, um, as we saw, um, we'll see in the example using Gulp. Or uh, Babel node, which is a uh, uh, essentially a node uh, runtime that uh, runs a pre-compilation step with Babel, or even using the uh, sub-service uh, 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 REPL uh, available on the Babel website just for casual transforms of JSX uh, when you want to convert something easily to a string. So uh, in browser transform takes advantage of a specific uh, flavor of Babel called uh, browser uh, Babel browser, uh, which has a browser.js file that recognizes specific script tags with a type of text Babel or ECMAScript-6. 
and uh, compiles them uh, before actually executing them. So this is very uh, useful if you want to try something out uh, very easily. This is um, also um, uh, similar to various uh, templating engines like uh, uh, John Resic's uh, jQuery template, a uh, simple template uh, hack that's pretty much used in 75% uh, of the web by now, or even uh, uh, underscore templates. So you use a specific uh, um, type for your script tags to define a specific behavior associated to that script tag. But it's not for production use as it's uh, doing a, um, a, a real-time compilation and it's a very inefficient. The main option for production use, of course, is to use a command line build uh, using the Babel um, executable directly or through uh, the various bindings that exist, for instance, for, for Node. So um, you uh, normally pass a, an input file, which is the source file you want to compile with Babel, and specify the output file. Uh, you can even compile a, an entire directory. So for instance, pass in the source directory and uh, uh, pass in the output directory. So file by file, that will be compiled one by one. And uh, there is another convenient option to watch the, the input file or directory so that you um, do not need to run it again. So it essentially stays running in the background and uh, uh, recompiles every time there's a change to the files in the file system, which is very useful for developing and uh, uh, seeing the, the, the output in uh, real time. And um, as uh, we saw earlier, you can pass a, a list of plugins or uh, a list of presets uh, as well. So these are um, essentially adding on top of the Babel RC file. And you can add to the to those that are already defined in the Babel config file. Uh, finally, Babel node is the uh, uh, is an add-on that comes with Babel CLI. You should not use it in production because it's uh, uh, storing the uh, the object cache in memory and compiles on the fly before actually executing node on the uh, on the script. But it's very useful if you want to try some some. Uh, ES6 or um, uh, JSX sources just um, without compiling, etc. It's very uh, handy for testing things out. It's very slow, so you, you will wait for a few seconds before a um, very complex source file is uh, executed with Node. And finally, the, the uh, self-serve is uh, REPL, which is a read eval print loop, so essentially waits for input, uh, um, uh, parses, uh, prints the output, and uh, waits for input again. And uh, it's available on the uh, Babel website. It's uh, also um, something that you can run locally if you uh, clone the Babel repo and run it locally. Beyond JSX, uh, a bit of flashy color here just to bring it to your attention. <laughs> Uh, Babel does compile JSX, but not necessarily to uh, React. There is a couple of uh, few uh, little advertised options that allow you to specify a different target other than React. So for instance, in the uh, Transform React JSX plugin, you can pass the Pragma option. So you see uh, in the Babel RC, you can pass a second argument to the plugin. So you specify a, a different behavior from the one out of the box and uh, uh, essentially replace the occurrences of react.create element with DOM, which could be whatever you like. And you normally associate it with a JSX compatible virtual DOM library. So uh, the effect of that Babel RC option is that script.js, which is a, the usual nav user ID, my username uh, is not compiled to react.create element but instead is, used, is compiled to DOM in the same arguments that you would normally receive uh, with React. So this allows you to compile to other JSX compatible libraries like uh, Riot, Yoc, uh, Docker.js, etc.
which kind of is a part of a booming ecosystem which is amazingly uh, fast growing. And so uh, let's jump into um, examining in detail how do you actually build uh, JSX classes. We saw how you compile JSX using Babel, but how do you actually build uh, JSX files into a single layer? Uh, a good option is to use Browserify, which is a, um, uh, a build tool written by, as we saw, uh, we saw earlier, Substack to bundle node modules for using the in the browser, which adds uh, very little overhead to uh, the aggregated JavaScript to make sure that the uh, uh, node primitives can run in the browser instead of the node runtime, and uh, can be uh, composed uh, can be in, in, uh, augmented using composable transforms like brfs to make sure that file system operations that would normally use uh, the node fs module uh, actually work when you build so you can align files you can read the content from the file system and use it as a string or as a stream or amd phi which uh, allows you to uh, uh, aggregate uh, required js uh, compatible modules and even generate source maps using the debug option how do you actually use JSX with Browserify? So there's uh, the main avenue is to use Babelify, which is a transform for Browserify that uses Babel uh, behind the uh, in the background and requires uh, plugins or presets. So similarly to Babel, you have to specify which presets or plugins you want to use, and uh, you would call it from the command line using uh, subargs, which is a, a way to specify hierarchical uh, nested arguments like uh, ES2015 and React are subargs of uh, Babelify, which is itself a subarg of uh, Browserify hyphen T. So you specify the Babelify transform with two presets uh, and uh, uh, Browserify applies it to app.js writing the output to bundle.js. Or you can use Babelify uh, and Browserify, of course, uh, through a build tool like uh, Gulp or Grunt or whatever, um, importing the Browserify and Babelify mod modules and uh, uh, passing the transform to uh, the Browserify uh, 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 command before you actually call bundle, and then piping the output to uh, the usual gulp streams. How many of you use uh, gulp to to build? Cool. Um, and so you may you may be familiar with this uh, streaming kind of approach where you get a stream in the input, you transform it using a um, like a stream transform function, and then you pipe you pipe it to another uh, to another destination. Um, Previously, before Babelify, uh, the alternative was used uh, to use Reactify, which is based on uh, React tools. It's a uh, legacy package from uh, uh, Facebook's React that uses uh, JavaScript transforms, but it's uh, now deprecated together with JSX transformer.js. So uh, probably this uh, Reactify transform for Browserify will also follow the same uh, destiny and will probably be phased out. And uh, similarly to uh, Babelify, you would pass it as a transform to Browserify through command line or uh, use it as a transform for Gulp uh, importing the corresponding module. So essentially, uh, this is probably going to disappear, but the, the, the takeaway from this is that you get uh, a, an entry point for Browserify, which is the main uh, um, module that your uh, build will use to traverse all the dependencies. Then you transform the sources using uh, Babelify or in this case Reactify. Passing those presets that uh, specify how Babel uh, behaves and then bundle all the uh, corresponding uh, transform the modules into single output. Um, in this case, the example uses vinyl source stream, which makes it appear as if, uh, if it were a single uh, virtual file called main.js and then writes it to 
the output directory. Uh, but the, the main uh, takeaway here is that you transform each module as it's loaded from the file system and then you aggregate it using Browserify. Uh, Webpack is a rather uh, new addition to the, to the ecosystem. It's uh, very uh, powerful, it's mind-blowing. I think it took a few months to actually get started. The documentation is quite confused and uh, obscure and uh, it mostly looks like a manifesto rather than a uh, working manual. Uh, so if any of you has understood 99% uh, of it, uh, I'd like to talk to you because it's very difficult to understand how it works before you actually read the, the sources. And it's a beyond Browserify, it also uh, specifies uh, loaders that transform pretty much any incoming sources. So you can inline into JavaScript, not just the proper JavaScript sources, but also CSS, HTML, templates, images, fonts, whatever you like. And it can also spit out chunks. So if you're familiar with required JS, you can specify layers. Uh, so that your application doesn't load 100% uh, of your JavaScript on first page load, which is terrific for performance, but it uh, uh, incrementally loads more JavaScript as you navigate through the through your single page application, and uh, um, allows the developer to specify which uh, uh, chunks can be split out into separate units, and it can also be uh, expanded using plugins that specify different behaviors so to uh, parse different uh, module systems, etc. It's out of the box, I think, compatible with required JS, AMD, ES6 modules, and uh, I think also UMD. So, again, um, it works as a command line tool um, because everybody lo loves the command line, and you install it uh, through NPM. And uh, it also supports uh, uh, specifying uh, uh, a different config file. By default, it looks for webpack.config.js, uh, but you can also uh, specify different ones, so you can have different profiles if you want to uh, target different uh, build profiles, or even have a production versus development build profile. And uh, uh, needless to say, supports watching the file system. So it rebuilds everything incrementally only in the modified parts when some files change. Um, the configuration object is a pure uh, JavaScript object that's exported by that config file that we saw earlier and specifies the entry point, the output, and the uh, um, path, file name, etc. It's using conventions with name or ID to specify uh, uh, patterns for file names. And also um, allows you to define loaders so that you can parse different uh, file types using different loaders. For instance, in, the ca in this case, we parse uh, extension files with extensions.js or JSX with the Babel loader, so we ensure that the React uh, code is correctly transformed using uh, Babel. And can be uh, conveniently used with uh, Gulp. This is the short uh, form where we actually call Webpack uh, directly. But you can also instantiate uh, a Webpack uh, builder object using uh, a single argument, which is the configuration, and then you get a compiler object in return. Uh, you can use it to run uh, with a very uh, node-style uh, callback uh, function as uh, argument or watching, uh, passing extra options to, to watch, and uh, again, passing the usual node-style callback, a second argument. And so this uh, essentially does the same transform and uh, uh, compilation that we saw in the CLI. Um, example just uh, managed through a uh, build tool like Gulp. And similarly, you can use uh, your uh, build tool of choice. You can use uh, Broccoli, you can use uh, Grunt or whatever. And besides these two guys, uh, there is an array, ever growing array of uh, legacy stuff that gets deprecated as we go. Um, I think most of these used to work with React 0.12. Now that we're 
zero fourteen, I think, uh, unless uh, zero fifteen came out without me realizing. Uh, most of these are no longer applicable. So, for instance, JSX Transformer was used to do in-browser transforms, uh, which is what Babel browser uh, does today. React tools were uh, a set of complementary tools to React, like a JSX compiler, like a com command line tool to actually compile to JSX, but also uh, a JavaScript uh, helper that accepted sources in uh, on the way in and produced uh, JS on the way out at the base of uh, Reactify, which is now deprecated. And finally, JS Transform, which, is, was a, which was a simple utility for pluggable JS syntax transforms using Esprima, uh, again, is also deprecated. So if your project uses these, uh, it's a good idea to start moving to Babelify or uh, pure Babel. For further reading, uh, it's a good idea to watch the Babel blog. They're pretty an act, a pretty active community. Uh, and of course, the React blog is probably uh, an obvious place to, to look. Um, which, funny enough, is written using, uh, I think it's Jekyll. So it's actually written in Markdown uh, in the repo. So it's a good idea to watch the repo full stop for any changes. And that's it. So if uh, people have questions, please uh, do ask. Um, I'm not a 100% expert on the matter, so uh, most of the questions will be more like uh, homework for me to figure out. <laughs> so very welcome to, to, to get those questions. Which one? Legacy reason to keep using Gulp when you have Webpack, mm -hmm. when you have a, a, a significant fondness for Gulp, you're probably better off just using Webpack Dev Server. Or oh, Dev Middleware. yeah, I forgot to mention there's also the the possibility to run the Webpack as a Dev Server, like uh, I can't remember which, what was the other example that came to mind. Was it JS Coverage? So essentially, like a very um, black box that gets the sources on the way in and uh, publishes the the output compiled on the way out. So uh, do, you, do, you, do you see that as a more efficient way for, for the workflow? Yeah, no, I mean, Gulp is necessary then. You're using Gulp to build a JavaScript bundle, basically. Oh, well, this is part of a more, uh, a bigger Gulp file, of course. But yeah, so I'm saying if you're starting Greenfields, yep. you probably, you don't need Gulp. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. So Webpack since Webpack server. essentially handles all these, yes. uh, yeah, yeah. And it has a, a dev server, so you can just develop using Yeah, Webpack. yeah, yeah. But in legacy projects, for instance, you, you may have a uh, separation between CSS resources and uh, JavaScript, so you don't want to merge all the, them all into single yeah. JavaScript layer, which would be probably a good idea if you want to start, uh, like, Greenfield using Webpack. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. Unless yeah, yeah. legacy reason. No, no, yeah, you're totally right. Wouldn't want to be doing this. Oh, yeah, this is coming from an, an existing Gulf file that's augmented to, to use Webpack. The, the, the undeclared, the preamble is, if you already use Gulf in your project, uh, this is how you use Webpack in Gulf. Good point. Other questions? I was pretty sure I had a, a slide about Yawk in the... Can't find it anymore. Maybe it's in the speaker notes. But anyway, how many of you use other uh, alternative uh, virtual DOM libraries besides React? Yay! Which one? Cool. All right. Thanks very much.